So there was a Licorice Recoil event on July 23rd and they must not be finally announced what the new anime project for the series is going to be. And it's going to be six short movies depicting the characters and stuff. So it's not really a new season, a new sequel or a movie or anything. And they didn't say a release date for these short movies either. So like it's still going to take a lot of time before we get some new uh, Rico Rico. And like I still never try to read about the show's production in detail, except the Sakuga Buru Sakuga blog article, which is very good, uh, telling stuff about uh, how it was a pretty chaotic production and how like it was delayed for six months actually, uh, some stuff like that. And from this article, you can tell that uh, Licorice Recall was pretty much a one and done project. And my opinion is Aniplex and they, Sony Aniplex, they never expected it to get this popular, so it was like a one and done project and they didn't plan to make anything else after that. So now it's been two years since the show aired, it was aired in July 2022, and this new anime project was announced in February 2023, and now we finally heard that it's going to be six short movies, but there's still no release date, so now you can tell that they're kind of scrambling, they never really expected to make more. So yeah, uh, you first have to wait for these six short movies to release, and then maybe they're going to announce a real sequel, uh, season two, uh, a sequel movie or something but yeah and the events had the show's director and the seiyu for takina and shisato and they announced a lot of other stuff as well they announced uh, a collab with uh, with the chimida sumida aquarium somewhere in tokyo i didn't check where it is tokyo tokyo sky Town. they announced a uh, collab with an aquarium which is pretty funny uh, another very funny thing is uh they announced nfts actually <laughs> <laughs> which tells like a lot like the nft market is pretty much crumbled and collapsed outside uh, everywhere around the world but in japan there's still a lot of people still believing in it and still making projects about it and so yeah they actually understand uh, nfts and it's pretty funny because like this is a, a very good example to show like how, how the higher ups uh, taking the decisions they have no idea what the fans want and how people feel uh, like you can like not none of them ever check twitter for a few minutes and see like how pretty much every international anime fan outside japan hates nfts and most people inside japan like they started to realize that it's whatever but they still like uh, as, as someone who checks uh gaming news on japanese sites nearly every day like every week or so you still have some some companies some random companies announcing they're developing some nft game some random developers participating in some random events and saying they're making nft games etc so yeah, sadly, it's not over yet in Japan. It's far from over, and like I'm not sure when they're going to realize like how how much like how much of a scam it is. And another interesting thing is soon, like in uh, two months, it's going to be TGS Tokyo Game Show. And last year, last year in Tokyo Game Show, you had a lot of booths, a lot of N NFT booths. So I'm curious to see how it will be this year, and uh, if if there will be a lesser amount, and um, if like more and more and more even more companies are, are starting to do it or not so yeah it's pretty crazy this actually made some uh, actually making nfts and they also announced what else uh they announced some new merch uh with most probably uh a new yukata figure for yeah a new kimono figure for chisato um it's, it's really nice right um, uh, a collab with uh, uh, a gacha game called, called Ragnadol. I never heard about this game, so yeah, yeah. And yeah, speaking of which, like, I am one of my one of the examples which shows, in my opinion, that Aniplex never really planned for Licorice Recall to get this popular is they actually didn't make a gacha game, which is really surprising because it's been two years now since the show has been aired, and like the making a quick gacha game would have been like the easiest way for them to make some money, and they didn't even plan to do that. So yeah, I think in my opinion, the higher ups at Sony and Aniplex they never expected this anime series to get this popular, and from what we can from what we know from the production all of the stuff was kind of like a, a one and done thing and they didn't plan like they didn't plan to make more and it was a pretty chaotic production despite the show's really high quality and so yeah 
and uh, they also showed some new visual for these wedding dresses figures of Takena and Chisato, which are really nice as well. So yeah, uh, Licorice Vicor is still co-tuning, and since then they also made some stage plays, etc. But yeah, still no new anime, pro still no new real sequel or anything. And so yeah, uh, and finally, like you remember how Kojima Hideo was really into the series uh, because it's obviously Licorice Vicor a ton of references to action movies and to older movies, and it's one of the reasons why it got so popular in my opinion. And uh, it's pretty funny because I uh, was imagining like two years ago when the show was airing, I was imagining that Aniplex will try to make a gacha game and try to get Kojima to make a quick scenario or a quick collab event uh, about it, but this didn't happen. So I'm kind of surprised this didn't happen. But yeah, so yeah, they're going to make six short movies and the skin no release date for these movies. Uh, we'll know what they will be at a later date, and I guess. Uh, and they show this sole key visual for the for the new short movies. So yeah, it's going to show more of their daily lives and maybe I guess some more gunfights and some more rocking at the maid cafe and some usual stuff we saw in the original TV series. And uh, speaking of Aniplex, one of the games they recently had a hand on Astro Tataricus is going to close down, and it was a really cool looking game and. It, and tactical RPG on, with gacha systems and it was pretty ap appealing because it had a calendar and some social interactions like some persona and like some uh, fire emblem free houses and it had also some tactical battles with some 3d animations and some like the grid was in 2d in 2d pixel on the battles themselves and the cutscenes are in 3d with some self shading effect and actually it looked really cool but sadly um a few weeks ago, the developing studio called Gumi they announced that basically the game has been underperforming and their other projects, for example, uh, Final Fantasy Brave Exus has been underperforming as well. So they actually announced some layoffs and it's pretty funny because these last few months we've sadly all of the layoffs happening in the gaming industry we had some people saying that layoffs don't happen in japan which isn't true and i've seen some articles talking about how this is false and how layoffs do happen in japan but like it's more complicated because the workers are, are more protected by the law so it's not that their bosses don't want to do layoffs and uh, it's not it's not like the companies and the bosses in japan are nicer than the ones outside japan it's more like that they can't easily lay off people so that's one of the things that came back the most in these articles but i didn't see many people talking about this and thankfully automaton translated it and talked about it that many companies they aren't doing layoffs technically but they're basically doing uh, beneficial retirement packages they call it basically they ask people to leave and give them some stuff so they leave and so it's basically layoffs, but like, hey, people are becoming redundant and like they they lazy off in a like more kind of nicer way. But yeah, layoffs do happen in Japan, and Gumi, is a developing studio for Astro Tatakus, is in trouble recently. So yeah, sadly, I'm not surprised that they announced the game is closing down. And it's pretty messed up because the game was supposed to release in English. Uh, the Japanese release was in sometime in 2023, and then there was an English Twitter uh, announced talking about the about the about the English release, and it was supposed to release in English in 2023 as well. But they say that they're delaying it because they need to work on some stuff, seeing the feedback from the Japanese version. So there was this message like in December 2023, and then the Twitter was wasn't silent; they kept. Uh, they kept advertising the game, etc. But yeah, sadly, when the announcement came from the Japanese version on July 24, they also announced that the game actually is never going to release in English. And yeah, it's pretty crazy because, like, think about all the translators, etc., that were actually working on this and the, like all their work going to waste. And that's true as well for all the developing teams. So yeah, yeah, just like I was talking about it in Twitter. So. 
Yeah, uh, in a sense, like a lot of people lately uh, have been saying that the Gacha game industry is going to collapse and there's going to be a, a bubble burst and stuff. But if you think about it for a few years, like it's already been there because depending on your point of view, like think of all of the Square Enix games that have been closed, for example, like, for example, the, the Full Metal Alchemist game, which was really high budget and really cool looking. And it was also a tactical RPG, just like Aster Totericus, and it closed down after like a one year because like the higher ups at Square Enix, like they have very, I think in my opinion, they have very unrealistic goals. So like if your gacha game is at, isn't Genshin, like they close it down after a year or something. So yeah, think of all the gacha games Square Enix have closed down. Uh, think of ta Tales of the Race and that has closed down. Tales of uh, Astera, the, all, the, all the latest continuing tales of uh, games, gacha games from Van Nine Amco have been closed down. Like, these last few years, like, it's very usual to see some gacha games close after six months, after seven months, so even even fewer months than that sometimes. Like, a lot of them don't even reach the half anniversary. So yeah, from your point of view, depending on your point of view, the gacha bubble burst is already happening for years now. But yeah, in my opinion, things would get even worse because, like, a lot of companies are making very high budget like i don't really like to call them like this but it's pretty much genshin clones and a lot a lot of companies are making genshin clones like open world action rpg with an anime style and with some gacha systems and sadly like there's no way each one of them is going to be as much of a success as, as genshin so obviously some of them are going to be closed down after like a year or something and obviously it's going to be much worse than now because like to make these open world games a lot the, the teams the development teams are much bigger so a lot of more people are going to lose maybe at worst their jobs and maybe all of the work they made on a game is going to disappear forever but yeah uh like there's the uh, there's a game for the Seven Deadly Sins, there's a game for Awo no Exorcist, there's a game for Mira, Mirai Nikki, like the stones of open world gacha games in development at, at, this, this, at this moment, so there's no way they're all going to be working as, as much well as well as Genshin, so yeah, it's, like, it's definitely some kind, of, some kind of gacha game burst coming in the next few, maybe not months but maybe years in my opinion so yeah it's pretty crazy astro tertericus is going to close down and it looked actually really cool like if you check the the real trailer so yeah you have you had some school elements with some with some kizuna uh, some friendship elements just like persona etc nowadays something very popular in rpgs nowadays and you had some tactical rpg battles where the the tactical map is in 2D with some really cool pixels and then the battle animations themselves are in 3D and it's kind of like the Fire Emblem Three Houses. So yeah, it's, it's crazy that this game is going to close down and I wanted to try it out myself but I never had the time to do so. So yeah, pretty crazy. It's like closing it down after one year and a half or so. So yeah, and they were supposed to do an English version but it's never going to release now. So next up, we're obviously going to talk about the new gameplay clips from the Romancing Saga 2 remake. So first they reveal this one, which is basically showing how you can improve the capital, the imperial capital. As the emperor, you can decide to develop certain buildings, etc. And this is a system that was already in the original game. However, in the original game, it was kind of more like... This time it's much more streamlined, because in the original game, you will you you are playing as the emperor, and whenever you will sit on the throne, the the, ad, the adjutant, your your advisory NPC, he will come to you and ask, "Hey, we can improve this building. Do you want to improve it? Yes or no?" And you didn't really have a choice. Like, if I rem if I remember correctly, like you didn't really have a choice, like what to upgrade or not. It was you you would just get asked by the NPC, do you want to upgrade this? Yes or no? And this time they're making it much more simpler and much more streamlined with a map of the city and you can choose a building in the city and you can choose directly to upgrade it and like i often say romancing saga 2 is a game where the gameplay and the narrative is very weaving together so for example as long as you don't research into the magic institute and as long as you don't build the magic institute etc you will not unlock the characters who can use magic and you will not be able to recruit them directly in the capital so it's 
a really funny system and it's a really like it's one of the many things that makes romancing sagatsu so endearing so it's really cool that they're making an actual like like i wouldn't say it's a city builder simulator or something obviously it's not sim city but it's pretty funny they actually made a map of the city and you can select the building and it directly tells you how much it's going to cost and you can upgrade the buildings like this it's very funny and next up we have the formation system which is another key elements of romancing sagatsu uh, you have a party of five characters and in the menu at any time in the menu you can change the formation and it's very important because depending on the formation your status your, your character status will vary greatly for example there are some formations the characters at the front they will act much faster than, than the characters at the back or for example the character at the center will act, act much more slower but he will receive much less damage etc so it's it's very very important to change your formation depending on the situation and you learn new formations uh, from doing some quests in the game and also depending on the on the emperor you picked when you switch emperors when the emperor inherits the skills of the past emperors uh, if it's if it's a new emperor you never had if it's, if you new emperor as a new class uh, it's you will learn you will learn a new formation related to this class so Squad formations are pretty much like one of the, the one of the most important things in the game. So you will definitely need to spend a lot of time in this menu and reorganize your party. Like sometimes before a boss, sometimes uh, in inside a dungeon, etc. And so it's a really really cool system, and it's one of the many peculiarities of the battle system in *Romancing Sagatsu*. Next up, they explained how the game has some remastered versions of the BGMs and some the original BGMs as well. So you can select which version of the BGM you want to play, like the remake version or the original version. And here we change the original Super Famicom version of the OST. Personally, I prefer this one because, like, it's more nostalgic. This is the title screen music, by the way. Uh, this remake is going to be so awesome. Like, I'm so excited for this remake. It's going to be so awesome. Uh, next, we have a quick short clip showing the differences between the classes. And there's over 30 classes in the game. So with over 30 different characters and they all have different studies. This, these are the proficiencies using weapons. Like I explained in a previous video, there's like one just short, just normal swords, short swords, axes, wands, clubs, uh, uh, spears, bows, and I think for, uh, barehanded, I think was the last one was. And you have the different magics, elemental magics, fire, ice, uh, earth, wind, light, and there's also darkness, but you need to do a specific thing to unlock darkness. So that's why it's not listed here. And I'm really excited to see how the darkness unlock quest is going to happen in the remake because it's one of the most it's one of the best moments in the original game <laughs> so yeah uh, there's different classes and they all have their different statuses and yeah and you can quickly tell now the different uses of each class in this remake so it's another thing they made very easy to understand for newcomers And uh, next up, it's the difficulty settings. So like I previously explained, the remake has three different difficulty settings, which is cause wall. If like, if you don't really want to challenge, uh, if you're not used to RPGs, there's normal, which is normal difficulty. And interestingly, there's no hard mode. The final, the highest difficulty at the beginning is original, which is basically uh, a difficulty which is similar to the original game. And it's pretty funny because they acknowledge that the original game is pretty hard. But in my opinion, it's not that hard. It really depends on how much you understand the game. And it's pretty funny because it's definitely like 
Well, to be honest, I only played the remaster. I never played the original Super Famicom game. And to be honest, the remaster is slightly easier because they already streamlined a few things. They made a few things easier to understand and they added a few a few spells, I think. Like some, some really broken spells, I think, are only in the remaster, but I'm not really sure. But uh, especially because you can tell some of these spells are so broken because in the remaster, they, they added a new bonus dungeon with a new bonus boss and actually some of the spells don't work on the bonus boss because or else it would be too too easy <laughs> so you can tell the developers at Square Enix like the, the saga the saga developing team they definitely know what they were doing like they didn't accidentally break the game or anything they do know that some of the spells and some of the skills in the game are extremely strong so they actually made it so the bonus boss is immune to some of this magic so it's very funny so yeah Personally, I'm probably going to start the game in original, but yeah, hopefully when you finish the game once, there's a higher difficulty, because if you know about the game, I think even, like if you're a big fan of Romancing Saga 2, and if you know the game really well, if you know the events really well, if you know how to unlock specific specific things really well, like I think even the original difficulty will be too easy for you, so hopefully you can unlock another higher difficulty on to finish the game, and it would be fine to do it on a second run, because it is a very high replay value game, just like Saga Emerald Beyond, that just released and just like most of the saga series so like hopefully it's just some new difficulty you unlock when you clear the game because it's a highly replayable game just like most of the saga series so i'm pretty excited for this and here in the next gameplay clip they revealed they actually revealed a very big change in the remaster in the remake compared to the remaster and compared to the original super famicom game so i'm gonna Put it on full screen so you can cl clearly see what the change is. So now you have a light bulb icon to show you the chances of Hirameki, the, the chances of learning a new skill. Like if you, this skill has a big light bulb, so if you use this skill, there are the big chance of learning a new skill. So this is a brand new thing, and this will make things much more streamlined because I'm like maybe I kind of have some complicated feelings about this because maybe you could you could say that this would make the game too easy, but it really depends because sometimes you would spend a lot of time using the same skill over and over again without realizing that you cannot learn any more new skills from using that one skill. So I think it's a useful change at the end of the day, but maybe. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if you can actually deactivate this on the menu for like the hardcore fans who don't want to see this and who, who just want to go in completely blind and just keep using skills randomly to see which one has a higher chance to trigger Hidamiki and learn new skills. But yeah, because just like I explained, it's not really random. It depends of if you... If you're fighting against, against a boss or against a stronger enemy, you have a much higher chance of triggering a new Hirameki to learn a new skill. And if you're using, if your character is very proficient in using a specific type of weapons and you keep using these weapons, it will augment the chances of triggering new skills as well. So it's not completely random, but yeah, this system is definitely a big help for those who don't want to go in completely in the dark and want to have some hints telling you, hey, if you keep using this skill, it's a chance you're going to learn a new skill. So I think this is a good change of all. Oh, the screen bugged. Sorry. Uh, yeah, here. So yeah, he used the second skill, and then he learned a, a new one. So yeah. Uh, Nijigiri, Nitaigiri, I forgot how you can read this. I'm not good at kanji, but yeah. He using this skill with a big light bulb, and he learned a new... Another new skill. Mijingiri. Mijingiri is some it's one of, it's one of the most popular skills in the original game. It's an ALE and it hits several for several hits. Uh it it's all the enemy party, so it's a very really good skill. But yeah, this is the one this is pretty much the biggest change is the remake in my opinion. And yeah, so it's going to be interesting how much it changes the battle system. Uh, some quick news now, uh, Konami announced they're going to make uh, an art book for the Quiz Magic Academy series. And this is pretty funny because this is a series that is pretty unknown inside Japan. It's a series of arcade games based on uh, trivia, so it's multiplayer. 
uh, each player got to answer a series of questions and sometimes it's yes no questions sometimes you actually need to enter some words uh, it's a super long running series uh, it's been going for 21 years actually uh, it's very funny that they're making a an art book compilation with all the illustrations starting the first one starting the first game 21 years ago so it's pretty funny because when you see the same characters that have stayed the legacy characters of the series you can see how much their, their character design has changed and personally character design is one of the things i like talking about the most and like it's pretty funny because people will tell you how you can really see uh, it is reflects a specific era but in my opinion it's kind of wrong to to set a specific character design to a specific era because for example a lot of uh, american fans and anim american anime fans when they're talking about 90s character design they will say hey this is this looks like 90s character design but this just it actually just looks like sailor moon because for them sailor moon is basically 90s character design but it's that's wrong like uh, in every decade you always had various series with various character designs so there's not a single decade or a single year defined by a single character design it's much more complicated than that and even if you look at the same series like for example uh, to stay on the sailor moon example even if you stay on sailor moon like uh, because each anime series has different anime episode directors from one episode to another the characters will look different as well with subtle subtle differences but the characters will look different as well because there's various as chief animators who worked on the series right so even a series like sailor moon like you can't really say this is sailor moon like design because the, the characters actually look different from episode to episode so yeah so it's kind of like also like uh sometimes a lot of people say uh kotobuki tsukasa and uh, uh, uh kotobuki tsukasa sensei is the uh, author of cyber marionette and uh, Araizumi Rui is the illustrator of Slayers. They so often say that these two illustrators, these two artists, are like the defining, the defining character designers of the 90s. But that's not true because there's many other character designers that worked on on this in this era, and they all have different, very different styles. And Kotobuki Tsukasa Sensei also already said himself that his own style is actually a parody of uh, Araizumi Rui's drawings. So it's not really like it's kind of rare that some people. I always associate a single character design style with a single era because that's wrong but anyway so you can say you can tell how the character design has changed over the years over 20 years so it's pretty funny so like honestly even if i never actually played this, this quiz magic academy series myself i've known about it for over like maybe 15 years or something because you often see fan art of it uh, on the internet and because also pretty much every famous seiyuu ever actually voices a character in this series so it's pretty funny because if you look at the opening of the latest game in the series so it's an arcade series right so this is the opening of the latest version that released uh, in 2023 like if you look at the opening like all all the characters are voiced by super popular seiyuu so let me see if i can read some so Tamura Yukai, for example, extremely popular seiyuu, uh, Rika and Higurashi, etc. So Naga, I can read this, but uh, I know some of these names. I'm not good at reading kanji. Uh, you have Sugita Tomokazu, for example. So yeah, all the popular seiyuu are voicing characters in this series, but no one knows about it as a Japan, so it's pretty funny. Uh, Ohara Sayaka, uh, Beato in Imineko, and many other characters. So yeah. Uh, uh, how do you read this again? Uh, Fukuyama, Fukuyama Jun, Fukuyama Jun, uh, Lelouch, of course, from Code Geass. So yeah, it's very funny that all the all the most popular series they all have some voice, some voices, some roles in this series, but no one knows about it because you can only play this if you're in Japan, right? Uh, I think there's a PC version as well, but I'm not sure. But yeah, it's initially an arcade series and it's been ongoing for 20 years now. So yeah, and it's pretty funny that. They're going to make an artwork because even yeah, if, if I never played the game, like I'm definitely going to try and, and get my hands on this just to see all the designs and all the characters. So yeah, it's usually 
like multiplayer and like usually people go with their friends play this in arcades so it's one of the actually one of the most successful s series of konami so it's still ongoing all the time and it's one of the series that i don't think they're ever going to stop it because it still makes them money and i don't think they spend that much money to make it so yeah and the last episode was last year so yeah they're still making it so pretty funny news just wanted to quickly talk about it Oh, just a quick news to say that Renatis has been released in Japan now on July 25th and they already published a quick patch to make some changes uh, regarding the feedback from the demo. Uh, I already talked about this in the past in a past video, right? The director read pretty much all of the feedback uh, on the Renatis hashtag on Twitter and they made some changes to the final game. So if you bought the game, if you imported the game in Japanese, make sure to... to to download the, the first patch, the release patch. And yeah, so there's going to be a feature on the game. Uh, there was a feature on the game in this week's Famitsu magazine. And yeah, so I'm pretty excited for this. I, sadly, I didn't buy it yet. Like I kind of want to buy it in Japanese instead of waiting for the, for the English version. But like, I already have so many games I want to play right now and I'm already on many other things so sadly i don't think i'm going to get it anytime soon like i'm not sure but yeah but anyway like they released a final trailer as well it kind of spoils some stuff so i didn't watch it fully so if you wanna check it out go go check out the food you youtube uh, or the renatis twitter so you can watch the trailer and also now that the game has been released the producer and director isobe takumi -san, uh said please do not spoil the game for those who are not playing it yet so yeah hopefully some people will will uh, follow this and i don't think you pub actually published streaming guidelines so i think it's fine to stream the game like however you want but yeah if you do stream the game if you make videos like the director asked to please ask to please not make some spoiling thumbnails, thumbnails and properly tag spoilers and not just share spoilers out in the open like this but yeah i feel like i still didn't buy it yet but i think i'm going to try and play it soon so i can avoid spoilers myself as well because yeah it's going to be hard but then again it's not going to be a very popular game so i doubt you would see some big spoilers out in the wild like this but yeah just in case so another thing i wanted to talk about is sadly there's a very popular very legendary series that actually passed away uh ohara noriko who was the voice of uh, Nobita in Dora Doraemon. She was the very first voice of Nobita in Doraemon and she passed away this week suddenly at 88 years old. And um, a lot of people were talking about it in Japan because she's one of the most popular seiyuu of all time because she voiced, she voiced the first voice of Nobita in Doraemon and she was also Doronjo in Yatterman. And Doronjo is one of the most popular one of the most iconic anime characters of all time like it's one of, she's doronjo is one of the characters that defines a many 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 other characters female characters in in anime and in japanese pop culture in general because she's basically the basis for for, for example uh, jesse in pokemon and all these kind of uh, like girl boss leaders like who slightly bad guys but actually not really bad guys and who are often in a tri in a trio of uh, two other people uh, for example uh, Gladys in Shigi no Umi no Nadia Gladys in Nadia is based on Doronjo as well Jesse Musashi in Pokemon is based on Doronjo as well and many many other characters and she's pretty much like just like Fujiko and just like Morrigan for example or just like Didlit and Pirates in Lotus War, for example, Doronjo is the kind of character that highly defined many, many other aspects of Japanese pop culture. So it's very, very sad that her seiyu, her first seiyu passed away. And Ohara Noriko, she was also singing some of the ending teams for some of the older Tatsunoko shows, most of Yatterman and Time Bokan as well. And she voiced many, many characters, and most notably in the first Macross series, she was voicing Claudia. And Claudia is one of the main characters of Macross, and she's one of the most important characters. And most notably, she's one of the first ever black characters in anime, because Macross was in 1982 or something, let me check. Macross was in 19... 1982 i think 
1982, yeah. So imagine like this was before before FF7 with Barrett, before like all the other popular black characters in anime. And there was Claudia. And Claudia is a very important character because she's actually the best friend of Misa, which is who is the main the main heroine of uh, of Macross together with Minmei. So she's one of the bridge operators in, in the Macross ship. And she's one of the most important characters in the series, actually. And yeah, and she's black and she's an actual black black African character as well because she has actual black hair as well, which is something like even nowadays, like sometimes when you have black characters in anime sometimes they're they're not really they're not really like i'm not sure to, how to explain this but they're not really black characters because they're based on like some archetypes like uh pilotes in lodos war so they're more like inverted colors than actual black characters i'm not sure how to explain this but yeah we often have dark skin characters in anime but most of the time they're not african and for example they, they are dark asian or dark south american or dark skins from other other ethnicities but it's very rare to have actual dark african characters with some actual black hair black style style stylized hair so claudia was one of the very first black characters in anime and she's a very important character in, in, the, in the macro story so yeah this was a pretty big shock for me to learn that her series passed away suddenly and yeah sadly like this past few years like a lot of very important people be it seiyu or animators or directors have been pass passing away so sadly in a, in a sense i'm not that surprised anymore sadly because yeah uh, I remember like when Toriyama sensei passed away a few months ago, a friend of mine asked me if I was sad and I actually didn't was I wasn't sad because I'm actually used to it by now because there's many like there's many many very very iconic very legendary Japanese authors and mangaka and animators and seiyu etc who have passed away this last even this last four and five years so but yeah sadly the sun was a sad news for that happened recently and so if you look at ohara noriko san's list of roles she voiced nobita until 2014 actually which is pretty incredible she she, she actually retired from the role just 10 years ago which is very very recently like she voiced him for over 30 years which is really incredible and if you look at the li her list of roles she was a narrator in nichijo and yeah she voiced Daranjo until 29 as, as well 2009 as well and she was also oyuki in urisei yatsura and she voiced her for the new ova in the 2000s as well and who else was she voicing so yeah she kept voicing nobita in every new uh, Do doraemon movie every year and she was also Riki in Crusher Joe. I actually need to watch this series. I still haven't watched it. I know a little bit about it, but like I still haven't watched it at all. And another very iconic role is she was also in Captain Harak, uh, voicing Mimi in Captain Harak, and she was also vo voicing this character in Ginga Tetsudo Triple Nine and I'm not really sure how to explain this character because I don't remember it that well myself but I do know that this is one of the episodes that, that marked me the most when I was watching Ginga Tetsudo Triple Nine when I was a kid. Obviously I didn't watch the first airing in France, I watched one of the re-airing in the early 2000s and yeah this character left a really huge impression on me so that's why I actually have her among my favorite characters but so yeah i didn't even know her that she was voicing her so yeah suddenly hara noriko passed away so yeah and another interesting thing is uh araizumi urui sensei the illustrator of slayers explained that her son is actually an animator a very popular animator called atsuo uh, tobe atsuo uh, he was working on the slayer series on all of the slayer series the original series the next and try the opening animations for all three he worked on them uh, he's a free animator and he's still working even nowadays and he actually worked on g witch on uh, the Witch from Mercury, Gundam, uh, on many other recent Gundam series, on Unicorn, on Thunderbolt, on Jireko. Uh, he also worked on Doraemon, Doraemon as well, on Aikatsu, Gintama, uh, mainly Sunrise series, right? And uh, so, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, he's really a, he's a really big animator actually. So, so yeah, I mean, I, my thoughts are with him, and like hopefully her family will be able to get over this 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 very difficult situation. So yeah, like this, like I had no idea. Like imagine like she was one of the most legendary CEO ever, and her son is actually one of the most proficient animators of all time as well so this is really incredible and he was on the character design of Yakutate Japan as well which is one of my favorite series ever so yeah, this is crazy but yeah you cool you cool keep scrolling and scrolling and he worked on tons of my favorite series love enough of course like Neo Ranga, I need to keep watching this one day I never watch all of it and yeah Slayer Slayer Stray was on the opening on many different episodes and some key animations and, and storyboarded one episode Slayer Snakes the second season he, he also worked on the opening and did several episodes as well uh, yeah, on the original first season of Slayers as well, on El Azad as well. Like, tons of series are like, he actually worked on them, so yeah. Tons of series are like, Pat Labor, of course. Like, this is crazy. Dutchy Pair as well. Like, tons of things. And it seems like his first work was on Macros, so he was working with with mother in a way because she was watching Claudia and he was he worked on on episode thirty six. This was his first work apparently. So yeah, really crazy. So another quick news just to talk about how Type Moon they announced that they're going to reveal new details on Fate Extra Record, the remake of Fate Extra on August 4th at the FGO festival. So which is pretty exciting because I've been waiting for this game ever since it first got announced in 2020. And I remember making a summary of the live stream announcement in 2020. So hopefully inshallah I will be able to cover this new live stream as well and write about it on my blog. So yeah, let's watch this quick teaser trailer. And over on Twitter, the Fate Extra Record director and Type Moon Studio BB director Nino Kazuya also teased that there are going to be very cool information and surprising stuff and some stuff that will make you say, oh yeah, that's how they're going to do this. Oh, okay, I get it now. Oh, 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 this is going to be like this. Oh, okay, okay. So there's some stuff that's going to be announced on August 4th that's going to be really interesting. So I guess obviously they're finally going to announce a release date. But I guess it's also going to be a lot of cool information. So yeah, I really hope I will be able to watch this live stream and write about it on my blog. And still on the Fate series, they revealed this brand new official artwork for the Fate Stay Night upcoming concert. And this was announced like a few months ago on the 20th anniversary live stream with the CU where they announced the Fate Stay Night Remaster. They also announced two concerts, one concert for the anime OST and one concert from the original game OST. So they published this key visual for the concerts and they didn't say who drew it, but they only said it's someone from UFO Table. So it's definitely not Takeuchi because you can tell from the from the design it's not Takeuchi, obviously. But like they didn't say who drew it, which is a bit of a shame because it's really, really incredible illustration. So yeah, it's just someone from UFO Table. That's the sole thing we know. And yeah, really, really incredible illustration with Saber and Sak Sakura and Rin. So yeah. And I guess and at the FGO festival on August 4th, they're also going to reveal new details on the Fate Night remaster as well. So look forward to this as well.
So I guess the final thing I wanted to talk about is that Otaking Paul Johnson released a brand new anime he made over like six or seven years, which is an uh, an alien anime adaptation. And Paul Otaking Johnson is the guy, the sole animator who made the Star Wars anime thing like around 10 years ago. I'm pretty sure you, you've seen it. Uh, it was... Uh, it was here and yeah i think like he used actually to go on fortune like over 15 years ago or something and we actually used to talk together over there and he, i think he's actually a pretty cool person so that's why i wanted to shout him out and just quickly show obviously i'm not going to show the video here so just go to the channel i'm going to put the link here as well so yeah he's the same person who did the, the TIE Fighter Star Wars thing around 10 years ago. Uh, he did many other really cool animations. And he also did a really good uh, uh, OVA recommendation video. Like you should watch all of the stuff in this video. And I'm, I pretty much have seen everything myself, barring a few, a few, a handful of uh, OVAs in this. But yeah, you should watch this as well and, and take the, take the, take the recommendation from this. And, and yeah, watch, make sure to watch the audience video. So yeah, uh, and yes, uh, so yeah, he did this by himself and co-directed by Claudia Maki Montelegre. So yeah, it's a homage to Ridley Scott's uh, Aliens and stuff. So yeah, I've watched it myself and yeah, so that's just the final thing I want to talk about today because this is really, a really, really incredible work and like you should definitely follow him on socials and try to subscribe if you've got some some, some money to start with this current stuff. So yeah, thanks for watching this new episode of Food Metal of Community News. So yeah, I'm going to try to keep on making more of these and talk about more diverse things. So yeah, remember to like and subscribe and check my blog as well in the description. Thanks for watching. Bye.